Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cyber Spring 2023 webinars. I'm Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer. Today's webinar features Connor Copeland of the University of Montana, who will share his knowledge and experience with NextFlow DSL2, an analysis pipeline management software for computational research. Cyverse free webinars are part of our mission to deploy a national computational research infrastructure for science data, I'm sorry, scientific data-driven uh, discovery and to teach researchers how to use that cyber infrastructure. For information on our webinars and the playlists of our past webinars, please go to uh, our website, www.cybers.org slash webinars, and you can find everything there. Um, let's first take care of some light housekeeping, then Connor will take over. Uh, today's webinar is about 30 minutes long, and there'll be plenty of time after for your questions for Connor. Please open the Zoom chat window and type your questions there, and we'll address those afterwards. This webinar is being recorded, and I'll post the video recording and Connor's slides on our website uh, later today, I hope. So now I am pleased to introduce Connor Copeland. He's a master's student and a research assistant at the University of Montana in Dr. Travis Wheeler's Northern Branch Lab. His research interests include bioinformatics, viral genomics, and machine learning. He is currently developing an automated prophage annotation and visualization pipeline to simplify and searching for viral integrations in bacterial genomes. I also understand that while in Thailand last spring for the Comp Bio Asia workshop, Connor took the comparative biology aspect very seriously as he taste tested his way through the local street food specialties like fried scorpions. So with <laughs> that, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Connor Copeland. Hi, Connor. Thanks, Tina. Um, just a quick note, I think this will be a little closer to 50 minutes. I uh, made a couple of changes, but uh, without further ado, let's get started on the basics of NextFlow DSL2. All right. So first off, a couple of quick notes. One, I am not affiliated with NextFlow in any way, shape, or form. As far as I know, they don't know that I exist. Um, also, I wanted to cover a couple of key terms that will come up a few times in this webinar. You don't have to understand these to get an idea of what NextFlow does and how it works, but uh, these are words I'll be saying a lot, so I thought it'd be helpful to define them really quick. First off, we have HPC, that stands for High Performance Compute Cluster. These are just modern supercomputers. It's a bunch of computers all chained together. Users uh, log on on a thing called a head node, and they use a job scheduler to spin up compute jobs on uh, compute nodes. Um, just how you do big analyses these days. Um, another term is Linux. This is just an operating system. It's a uh, pretty popular uh, operating system for these HPCs. Another term are containers. Uh, here I'm talking about software containers like Docker or Singularity containers, although there's more than just those. What are they? Well, let's say that you have a tool that only runs in Windows, but you need to run it on something that isn't Windows, like a Linux uh, high-performance compute cluster. Um, what can you do? Well, the idea with a container is you basically make this like sealed off little bubble and in the bubble there's this environment uh, that you can set. It can be a Windows environment. You can install your tool that needs Windows uh, onto this container and the container itself can run uh, pretty much anywhere, even on this Linux environment, so that you can use this Windows tool even though you're not technically on a Windows operating system. Uh, it's just a nice way to make software more portable. Another term to know is command line. Uh, this is something that comes up if you use uh, computers a lot. Um, this is just where you can interface with a computer with a text interface instead of a graphical interface where you're clicking on things. Uh, you invoke NextFlow next through the command line, and it uses a lot of command line-like things. Um, so this will be the most confusing one if you're not super familiar with it, but again, you'll get the basic idea. Um, another quick term I'll be using a lot is genome. Uh, this came up in my introduction. 
genomes are just the collection of all of the DNA in an organism, and that DNA will do things like describe useful proteins that help the organism survive and do important biological jobs. And because there's all this information in genomes, we care about being able to find sequences in them, like the sequences for specific proteins. And so we have tools that can do this. Uh, they just look for a DNA sequence in a larger collection of DNA. A couple of examples are BLAST, which is really well known, and one that I use a lot called HAMMER. With that out of the way, uh, let's start talking about NextFlow. First off, what is NextFlow anyway? Uh, well, NextFlow is a free open source workflow management software based on Groovy, which is um, a variation of the popular Java programming language. Well, okay, what does that mean? What's workflow management software? Uh, so it, uh, a good example, about a year and a half ago in my research, I sat down and I was working on this uh, problem that Tina talked about briefly. The, the long story short is that I care about finding viral sequences in bacterial genomes, uh, a lot of bacterial genomes. So I wanted to make this automated process for taking a bunch of viral genomes and a bunch of bacterial genomes and looking for viral sequences, those viral sequences in uh, those bacteria. So I had all the steps of this figured out. I knew what tools I wanted to use and when I wanted to use them. And I had Python scripts that I'd written that would help do this, but I needed something that would actually plug them all together and manage them automatically, that would take these viral and bacterial genomes and run them through these tools for me and then feed the output from the tools into these Python scripts. And that essentially is what workflow management software is for. It's for taking this analysis that you know how to do and want to do and executing it automatically for you. And, you know, in simple cases, it's actually not that hard to imagine just doing this yourself, you know, writing a Python script or a bash script or whatever your favorite language is to run these tools and scripts one by one, one after another on a bunch of data. But things can quickly get complicated if you are doing a really big analysis or if you want uh, your pipeline to be able to be used by other people. Uh, for instance, let's say you're doing this big analysis. It takes like a week to run. And on day six of the week, um, one of your inputs has like the wrong formatting and the whole thing crashes. Now you've got this big headache. Some things have probably completed and you can use the results. Other things are probably not finished yet and you have to rerun them. It took six days to get here and you know it sucks to lose all that progress. So it'd be really nice if automatically your um, workflow or your pipeline, oh yeah, workflow and pipeline are terms that I'm using interchangeably in this lecture. There are some technical differences between them, but I think we can get away with conflating them here. So just say workflow is pipeline, pipeline is workflow. But um, getting back to this idea of losing progress, it'd be nice if your pipeline, pipeline or your workflow could save intermediate results as they're produced so that if something happens and it crashes, uh, you don't lose this stuff. You've already spent time and energy computing. Um, but then that's got its own headaches. What if you change the pipeline? How do you know that these results are still something you can use? When do you know that you have to recompute them? Uh, similarly, in the vein of making things more portable, uh, I don't want to ask people to install all of the tools that I use in my analysis, so it'd be nice if I could create a Docker container and just use that instead. But then I've got to figure out, okay, how do I run the Docker container that has the tools installed so that people don't have to install it themselves? That's a lot of work. Wouldn't it be really nice if someone else sat down and did all the work of coding this thing up so I don't have to? And that's the basic premise behind workflow management software like NextFlow. It comes with a lot of nice features that are difficult to code so that you don't have to make them yourself. What are some of these features? Uh, in the case of NextFlow, um, obviously it can automate your pipeline. It can, you know, uh, run each step one after another. It knows when some things have to wait on other things, which is great. Um, because it knows when some things have to wait on other things, uh, it gives you access to this sort of easy version of parallelization where NextFlow isn't going to make any individual thing in your pipeline run faster, but it can tell when two things can run at the same time. 
So if you're on a system with a lot of compute power, uh, you maybe want to run a lot of expensive jobs simultaneously so that it completes sooner because you're doing 10 of them at the same time instead of doing them one after another. NextFlow also supports this checkpointing thing that I talked about earlier, where it saves intermediate results in the pipeline in case there's a crash so that you can tell it to pick up where it left off after you fix the issue. Um, if you're running this analysis on one of those HPC systems, those big compute networks, uh, NextFlow can automatically talk to job schedulers that are in charge of sending jobs out to computers on the network. Um, if you've ever worked with Slurm or Moab, these are examples of these job managers. And uh, if you've ever written job submission scripts for them, NextFlow does that for you, which is really nice. You have to put a little effort into setting it up, but it's easier after you've done that. If you're not on an HPC, if you're on a laptop or a desktop or just a big, you know, individual server that's by itself, uh, NextFlow can keep in mind what resources are available on that system. So it'll queue up as many tasks as it can with the resources it has, but it won't queue up more than the system can handle. NextFlow also supports containerization with Docker Singularity. Again, this just lets you have this, own, this little sealed off environment where all of the requirements of your pipeline tools and software and scripts can live in this space that has everything they need to run, even if the system you're on doesn't have those things by itself. Finally, I should mention that there's workflow management software that isn't NextFlow. Uh, for instance, SnakeMake seems really popular, but the only one I have experience with is NextFlow, so that's what I talk about here. Okay, so let's say that you are officially interested in installing NextFlow and trying to put it to use. What do you need to do that? Well, all you need for NextFlow itself is Java, um, any version between version 11 and 18 works, and you need the NextFlow downloader, uh, which you can get through the command line tool curl, or you can download it from GitHub or on Conda through Bioconda. And there's a little link there to um, the NextFlow downloader. But keep in mind, if you're uh, installing NextFlow, you probably want to do things with it that uh, exist outside of NextFlow. You want to run a workflow or a pipeline, right? So you need all the stuff above to run NextFlow, but you're also going to need to have the tools and software that you use in your analysis uh, available as well, or containers with them installed. Okay, so let's say that you want to just run a NextFlow workflow. You don't really care about how it works. You just want to know how to run one. How do you do it? How do you use the thing? Uh, you use this command line uh, tool, nextflow run, which invo invokes a workflow and has three big arguments. One of them is a nextflow script. This is this uh, little guy right here, myworkflow.nf. Um, something else you need is a parameters file. This technically doesn't have to be its own separate file, but I like to keep them separated. These are just parameters in YAML format that uh, you expect might change from run to run of your workflow. Where is input data? Where do you want to put output? That kind of thing. Um, also, uh, we have this profile here. Um, the, the basic thing about profile is that it tells NextFlow how to run on this computer. Is there some middleman software it needs to go through to spin up a job, or can it just run things itself? Uh, these live in a script named nextflow.config. You can use other config files if you want, but you have to tell NextFlow which file it is in that case. Uh, you can also include other config files inside of configs in case you want to keep things separated a little bit. So now that we know that, um, what do these NextFlow scripts look like? Uh, how do they work? Um, this is sort of the high-level version. NextFlow scripts are made up of three big components, processes, channels, and workflows. Processes are represented by these blue boxes here, and these are basically the individual steps in your workflow or pipeline. Uh, these call something that exists outside of NextFlow, some software, some code, you know, whatever, something that's not in NextFlow itself. Uh, processes are chained together with channels. 
channels, their job is to move data around. So we can see on this little diagram, the channels are these red arrows. We have our input data, which is taken by a channel into our first process. And the output of this first process is sent to process two and also to process three, uh, because you don't have to have things being very simple and linear. Um, uh, output from processes can go to multiple places, which is nice. Finally, we have this thing called a workflow, which is this big gray box around our processes and channels. Um, this is where you plug channels and processes together. This is where you say, hey, channel A should take input data and go into uh, process one, and process one's output should go into channel B and then go into process two's input. Uh, workflows are also where you can have conditional statements in your pipeline. These are if x, then do y type statements, and they allow you to make decisions based on what's in your pipeline with regards to what you want to do. To help make this all a little bit more concrete, I have an example Nextflow script. But before I show it to you, I want to briefly talk about different versions of the language that Nextflow uses to write these scripts. Uh, these are called DSLs, Domain Specific Languages, and Nextflow has two different ones, DSL1 and DSL2. Um, DSL1 is the older standard, um, uh, and I have less experience with it, but the, the, the big difference between the two, according to my understanding, come down to these workflows. In TSL1, workflows are automatically generated by Nextflow based on how you set up process input and output and how you declare channels. In DSL2, you, the user, actually write the workflow yourself. There are a couple of upshots to this. One is that it looks a lot like a programming language. So if you already know something like Python or Java, it's a little bit easier to figure out uh, what's going on and where data is going in your workflow. Um, it also makes it a lot easier to use conditional statements and to duplicate channels in case you want to send things to um, multiple processes. Before in DSL1, that was tricky. Uh, channels really only had one source and one destination, and you had to jump through hoops to change that. So now that we know what DSL1 and DSL2 mean, uh, let's look at an example DSL2 script. Um, first off, there's a lot of things that just appeared on the screen, but let's start by looking at these two little guys, uh, our parameters file and our config file. Um, here, again, these are two of our big arguments for next flow run. In our parameters file, we just have things that might change from run to run of our workflow here. Oh yeah, the, the purpose of this workflow is just to call a little command line calculator and to give it some mathematical equation that it will evaluate. Um, so in this case, in our parameters file, we have that equation 2 plus 2, or rather that statement. And then in config, we have our local profile. This just tells Nextflow, hey, you can run things yourself. There's not Slurm or Kubernetes or Amazon Web Services that you have to go through. You're just on a normal computer. Next up, we can look at this workflow script in the upper right. And specifically, what we can look at is the one process defined in this script. It's a really simple little process. It takes as input a string, and it just grabs input from standard out. If you don't know what standard out is, that's OK. It doesn't really matter. Just know that this process is grabbing um, the output of the tool we're calling. And the tool we're calling is this command line calculator, BC, basic calculator. And all we're doing is we're taking our string input value, we're creating a little command line command, and we're substituting the value of string in with this dollar sign curly brace thing. This just tells Nextflow, hey, grab this, whatever is in it, and put it here. And then we're feeding it into BC, which will evaluate it and tell us what the output is. OK, so now we have a process that does a thing. But how do we actually use the process? That's what this workflow is for. Um, in this workflow, we immediately define a channel. The channel holds our input data, which we grab from our parameters file. This math string that lives in parameters file, which is defined as just being 2 plus 2, gets grabbed here and put into a channel math string. Then we go and we say, hey, 
call this process use basic calculator and give it our math string take what it does and put it in this result channel and then use this view function to print it in uh this next flow interface that appears on the command line what interface is that it's this little guy uh here's the next flow command i use to run this on my laptop saying hey use this parameters file use the local profile and then next flow says oh i'm booting up I'm using local and I'm firing up this process. There's only one that's used here because there's only one thing we need to do. Once it's complete, it then prints out the value of two plus two, which is four. So revisiting this anatomy slide, hopefully it's a little more concrete now. We have processes that do things. We have channels that move data between processes and also allow you to filter or sort data. And we have this workflow where you plug channels and processes together. You can also have conditional statements, which I'll show you later. In fact, talking about later, let's talk a little bit about some of the next flow I'm going to show you as I talk in more detail about parameters, profiles, processes, channels, and workflows. Um, because it's split up over multiple slides, I just wanted to take a second to describe what it's doing to help orient you a little bit. Um, this workflow I'm going to show you in a minute uh, includes conditional statements and parallel processes, um, processes that can fire up in parallel instead of just one of them. It also uses Docker um, instead of just a locally installed tool. Um, what is the point of the workflow? It just takes the DNA sequence of a protein and it looks for it in a bacterial genome using a tool called Hammer. It's one of those sequence similarity search tools I introduced earlier. And the basic steps that this workflow performs is that it builds our protein into a hidden Markov model, which is necessary for the Hammer tool I use. It indexes the hidden Markov model to make Hammer run a little faster. And then we search those bacterial genomes for that sequence, that protein sequence, using the hidden Markov model. So without further ado, uh, let's talk uh, about things in a little more detail. First off, parameters and profiles. These are relatively simple still, but I have a more complicated example now. We still have options that might change from run to run, but there's a little more complexity. Um, for instance, we have this dollar sign curly brace project deer thing. What is that? Well, NextFlow defines for you some environment variables that you can access anywhere in a NextFlow script, even in a parameters file. And all this does is tell NextFlow, hey, substitute in here uh, the location in which this next flow script is being is living. So wherever this next flow script is located, we know that we have this seek folder and where we expect to find this seek folder. And in the seek folder, we expect to find a file called integrase.fasta. This is just the DNA sequence of the protein I want to go searching for. Um, likewise, we can define uh, paths uh, the paths to the bacterial genomes we want to look in. Uh, in this case, again, we say start where NextFlow lives, go to the seek folder, go into a bacterial genomes folder, and then uh, there's this asterisk. This means anything can match here as long as it ends with .fna. Again, these are just FASTA files, uh, but here we use the .fna extension. So any file in this folder that ends with .fna we want to grab. Um, likewise, we set a location, a folder where we want to put the output from this workflow. And we also have a couple of parameters telling us what kind of sequence we're looking at and um, whether or not we want to run those searches. This is uh, getting at that conditional statement I mentioned. We also have a more complicated profile because we're using Docker. Um, here we say, hey, you're still running locally, just normally on a computer, but I want you to use Docker. And specifically, I want you to use this Docker container that has Hammer installed, so I don't have to think about installing Hammer tools. Um, this isn't my Hammer container. This is one that I found on uh, Docker Hub. So that's parameters and profiles. 
if you wanted to run this on Slurm, you would change this executor uh, to be Slurm, which is something that NextFlow recognizes and knows what to do with. And there's a couple other options you might want to set, but we'll talk about that more in a second. Now, let's talk a little bit about processes. Um, a more complicated process than the one I showed earlier has four big parts. The first part are these directives at the top of the process. These tell NextFlow information that it needs to know about running uh, this script block down at the bottom here. So here we're saying, hey, I want you to give this process four threads. Um, which is just like what share of a CPU you want this thing to have. This is kind of an, a relatively computationally intense process, so we want to give it a little bit more. Um, we also say this should complete inside of an hour. If it doesn't, cancel it, something is wrong. And we want it to use uh, about, you know, no more than one gigabyte of RAM. Also, we again say, hey, use this hammer container. Because I set that in profile, you actually don't need to set that here because it is now just the default value for every process in this workflow. But I set it again just to be explicit. Next up, we have our input block. This tells the process what input it should expect. And if it doesn't get it, it'll throw an error and crash the pipeline. Um, there's a couple of different input types here. One is this val thing. Um, if you know anything about programming languages, you're probably familiar with basic data types like integers and floats and strings and characters. If you don't know what those are, that's okay. Just know that all of those basic data types in NextFlow uh, fit into the val bucket. So here we just have this value DNA. Um, it's just a string. Um, we also have a path to a file, our file containing our protein sequence we want to build into a hidden Markov model. Oh yeah, I should say what the process is for. This is the one that takes our protein sequence and calls this tool HMM build, which builds it into a hidden Markov model that Hammer can use. So we say, hey, I'm giving you the path to this file. And one of the upshots of this is that because we know it's a file, we get access to some nice attributes that we expect files to have. So later on, we want to grab just the name of the file without the extension. NextFlow supports that with this uh, doc simple name attribute that all path objects have, which is nice. Uh, moving on, we get to our output block. This tells NextFlow what outputs you should grab from this process and put into a channel. So here, what we care about is grabbing any file produced by this process that ends with .hmm, again, this asterisk says match anything as long as it ends with .hmm. Then we get to this script block. In this case, we're using the script block to call a tool, uh, HMM build, but this doesn't necessarily have to be a tool. You could call a Python script that you wrote. You could even put a uh, code in here, like Python code, as long as you have a little statement telling NextFlow, hey, interpret what's in the script block as Python. But in this case, I just have a piece of software, HMM build. We use this dollar sign curly brace notation to grab our seek type value and substitute it in here, which tells HMM build what kind of sequence we're working on, in this case, DNA. We also tell HMM build, hey, you get as many threads as the task says you get. Um, you should name your output after our input sequence file, but take the extension off and add on this .hmm, which is one of the handy things you can do with the substitution. Also, our input here is this path to our sequence file, our protein sequence. So this will take in the protein sequence. It'll make a file named after the protein sequence, but a .hmm instead of a .fasta, and it'll do it according to these variables. So that's one type of process. Um, the next process that we have in this workflow is HMM press. It is in charge of indexing our hit HMM file that we just made to make things run a little bit faster. And this produces a bunch of helper files. So we have more than one output file in this process. Um, you can, so this is just to demonstrate, you can grab multiple outputs and using this emit statement, you can give them a label. 
So if you want to have to grab these later, which I do later in the workflow, you can give them this little name so that it makes it easier to say, hey, specifically what I want from the output of this process is the HMM file. Uh, also, by the way, you can take this input value HMM file and you can just output it again. In this case, that's something that I want to do because I want the HMM file to be bundled with these helpful, hel uh, helper files. And then we can see the directives of this process are basically the same as before. And we have this really simple uh, script block where we just call HMM press on our HMM file. The last process in this more complicated workflow shows off something else, which are these cool dynamic directives. So dynamic directives, the value of the directive will change depending on uh, what values are present in the process at runtime. So here I've said, hey, I'm going to set this error strategy thing. Normally, when a process fails because you know it's run out of resources or there's a problem with the command, um, Nextflow will just immediately stop the whole workflow and it'll tell you, hey, there was a problem. But here we say, don't do that. Instead, try to run the process again and try to run it again up to two times for a total of running it three times maximum. Each time you retry it, uh, depending on what attempt we're on, give the process more resources, give it more threads, and give it more RAM. Why would you want to do this? Well, if you're on like a, a HPC system with a job scheduler like Slurm, Slurm keeps track of how many resources your job is using, and if it's using too much, it'll cancel it. So you don't want your workflow to stop every time that you get like an unusually large genome and it uses a little bit more RAM than you were expecting, and then your whole pipeline crashes and you've got to go fix it. Instead, you can say, hey, Nextflow, give it more resources, try it again. So if it's a resource problem, hopefully it'll work itself out. And if it isn't a resource problem, it'll stop everything and give you this error. So hopefully you can fix it. Um, another important directive here is this publish to your directive. This just tells Nextflow, hey, grab the output from this process and copy it somewhere. The reason why we're doing this is because this is the last process in my workflow. This is the one that actually searches in a bacterial genome for that protein sequence with the hidden Markov model. So we actually want to take, this is the output of the workflow. We want to take it and put it somewhere where we can get at it. Here I'm calling uh, this output deer. It's not defined in this process. I uh, defined it elsewhere. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but we can see it takes this input, the hidden Markov file, the hidden Markov model file, all these helper files, and a genome. It grabs this .tbl file as output, and that file is produced with this nhem scan command. So that's um, basically it for processes. Those are the big things to know. There's a couple of last notes I want to talk about. There is another component to processes that I skipped because it's semi-replaced in DSL2. It's a thing called a when block. It looks a lot like this input or output statement, except it says when with a colon. And then it has some logical statement that evaluates to true or false. If it's false, the process won't run. If it's true, the process will run. Um, again, this has been semi-replaced in DSL2. They strongly recommend that you keep all of those conditional statements in workflows now. But if a when block works better, they're still supported. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to talk about a few interesting directives that you might care about. Um, for instance, we have before script and after script. These do what they say on the tin. They let you run a little snippet of code either before the script block executes or after the script block executes. So if you want to make sure a file exists or you want to make sure it gets deleted, this is an easy way to do it. Uh, another thing that's good to know is cluster options. For instance, let's say you're running this on uh, an HPC that has the Slurm job scheduler. Um, a lot of these HPCs need you to specify what account you're using so they can bill you for the compute hours you're using. And uh, you would get that uh, into your workflow through this cluster options directive. 
Um, another directive is the Conda directive. You can give it a Conda package and Nextflow will go and download it if it doesn't have it and it will use it for that process. So this is just an alternate way to get at dependencies for your Nextflow process. If you don't have a container, you don't have it installed. Uh, the executor directive we saw before, it was set in the profile because what profiles really do is just set default options for every process in the pipeline, which you can overwrite for individual processes, but sometimes it's nice to have the default. Again, this is just the thing that tells you whether you're running locally or whether you have to go through a middleman like Slurm or Amazon Web Services or Kubernetes. Finally, there's the scratch directive. If you set this to true, Nextflow will change how it stores intermediate results for checkpointing to run a little bit faster on an HPC environment, which is a nice thing to have. And a lot of big analyses, uh, big workflows are run on HPCs, so it's particularly nice. If you want the full list of directives, I put a link here and the slides will be available uh, after this talk. Um, with that, we can start talking about channels. Um, channels do two big things in Nextflow. They allow communication between processes and they store and dispense data. Okay, what does allowing communication mean? Well, basically, the way that Nextflow knows that a process needs to wait on another process is how they're linked through channels. So here we have process A, its output goes into the input of B. So now Nextflow knows for B to run, I need to wait for A to finish first. If instead A and B are independent of each other, Nextflow knows that it can run them at the same time. That gives you that really nice uh, parallelism where you know if you're running uh, a lot of hammer searches, they're very expensive, they can take a while. So if you've got the resources for it, why not have three going at once? Uh, the other thing that about uh, channels do is they store or dispense data. And they can do this in one of two ways. Um, one, they can act as queues, which is uh, they take in a list of items and then they dispense them one by one in the order that they receive them until the channel is empty, at which point it stops dispensing anything because it doesn't have anything to dispense. So you put something in a queue, there's one copy of it, you take it out and it's gone. Uh, there are also value channels where you just put a single thing into the channel. In this case, the channel will just emit that value endlessly as many times as you need. Um, where channels get a little more complicated are with their operators. Um, operators do all sorts of things. There are, a, there are a ton of them in Nextflow and they let you do things like sort or filter the data in the channel or you could group or sum things in the channel. You can combine channels, you can split them apart, you can randomly sample the items in the channel, you can define some function that you want to run on everything in the channel. So maybe you care about, you know, how much uh, memory you're using. You could define a function that goes and asks, how big is every file in this channel and sums it all up for you. Um, Nextflow also have operators, uh, has operators that support parsing CSV or FASTA or FASTQ or text files, which are all pretty common inputs. Uh, the FASTA and FASTQ support is particularly nice if you're doing bioinformatics. Basically, what this does is it says, hey, the stuff in this channel are paths to uh, CSV files or FASTA channel or FASTA files or whatever. And so Nextflow will then go and parse those files automatically. It'll break up the CSV into individual entries that you can access directly from the channel. Or in the case of FASTA files, you could get just the sequences out of the files from the channel itself without having to write any code to do that for you, which is nice. Um, that is only a small number of the operators in Nextflow. There's a bunch of them, uh, and you can see them all in that link. Next up, uh, we can talk about workflows, which were that last component. Again, this is where you put processes and channels together. Um, in this case, this is the workflow for my little protein search. We can see that it has a conditional statement where we get this run searches value from our parameters file. I set it to be true in the parameters file I used when I ran this. It goes into a value channel that can emit it as many times as you need because there's only one thing in it. 
And if run searches is true, then we call our NHAM scan process we saw earlier that does the expensive hammer search. If not, we don't. Um, something to note is that this workflow doesn't have a name. It's just a workflow. This in Nextflow says to Nextflow, hey, this is where you want to start running the workflow. This is the main one you want to go to. And uh, as such, uh, here we can see we're doing things like reading in values from parameters into channels. We get our integrase path into a channel. We get the paths to our bacterial genomes into a channel, so on and so forth. And then we call this uh, build HMM thing, um, which is slightly differently named from something else I showed you. You haven't seen this yet because it's a sub workflow. Just know that you can define sub workflows, and I'll show you the sub workflow in a second. We get the results out of it, store it here. And if this is true, then we can take those HMM files from our sub workflow and uh, search our genomes with them. So that leads us to sub workflows. They're a new thing in DSL2. Why would you want to make them? One, it's sort of a neat way to split up the processes in your uh, workflow into their own little bits. Two, you can invoke a sub workflow directly from the command line with the dash entry option, which is nice. So you could say for um, this uh, next flow script, hey, just run, build HMM, don't do anything else. Um, sub workflows are a little bit more complicated than main workflows. Um, oh yeah, the other thing is you can import sub workflows uh, into other Nextflow scripts uh, if that's something that you want to do, which is nice. So, you know, in the future, I could say, hey, take this workflow and the processes defined in this file, use them somewhere else. I don't have to copy and paste it. Uh, going over our sub workflow a little bit, uh, it has some elements that are reminiscent of a process. It has a take statement that tells you what input you're expecting. The input's going to be channels, so we don't have to worry about a type. We have a main, which tells us what is happening in the sub workflow. Here we call our HMM build uh, process with its inputs, which we take. Uh, and then we just chain that directly into HMM press. Um, this little pipe character, all it's saying is, hey, the output from HMM build exactly matches the input of HMM press. Link these two with a channel. I don't care about actually making it and making it myself. Nextflow will do that for me with this little pipe character. And then we have an emit statement. This tells us what the output from the sub workflow is. This is why I had the emit statement from the previous process we saw, so that I could name the output from HMM Press to make it easier to put here. Um, when you have an emit statement. Uh, in a sub workflow, each one of these has to be an individual channel. You can't have a channel made up of multiple channels. Um, so you have to split it up into these, although back here, we just read it into one multi-channel uh, thing. So that's it for the big parts of Nextflow. Those are the basics of writing a Nextflow script. And hopefully now you can go off and start to experiment and work with these. Before you do, I have some quick tips for you that will save you some time. Uh, one, where you grab things from a parameter file matters. Do not do it in a process definition. If you do, you will sometimes get weird errors, but not all the time. And those are the worst kind of errors to have. Um, another thing to know is that in Nextflow, debugging can be a little bit difficult because it checkpoints everything. It stores all these intermediate results in these randomly named directories for each process. But that makes it difficult to walk from process to process to process in your pipeline, seeing what's happening to the data. Um, unless you know that Nextflow Run has some debugging options, which I only learned recently. Uh, so you can call some options in Nextflow Run that let you see the contents of channels, for instance, that make it a little bit easier to debug. So it's a little bit difficult, but they do have some tools to help you out. Um, something that you may notice if you go back and look at my code is that whenever I have a script block or anything where I use that dollar sign curly brace to substitute values, I use double quotes. And the reason is, is that substitution doesn't work with single quotes. 
So always use double quotes if you're substituting something in a string. Um, another thing that's worth knowing is that syntax checking my next flow is currently limited. What does that mean? It means that if you go and you write this wrong, you know, you say output instead of emit here. Um, next flow isn't that good right now at letting you know what mistake you've made. Some things it'll pick up on, like I think it would tell you that this should be emit and not output, but a lot of other subtle things would get missed. It wouldn't give you a super helpful error message. Uh, based on what I've seen on the next flow GitHub, they're working on it, but it's the way that it is right now. It's worth knowing about. Uh, one last thing that's good to know, what happens if you have a process? It takes in two Q channels, and one of them is shorter than another. Let's say that you have uh, channel A, and it has 10 items, and you have channel B, and it has 15 items going into a process. How many times is that process going to run? Well, it's going to run 10 times because it only has enough information to run it 10 times. So if something has happened and you're getting less output files from a process than you think you are, and you have different lengths of channels going into subsequent processes, you might get less output than you'd expect because you're getting 10 things instead of 15. Finally, uh, as someone who's been using NextFlow for about a year and a half now, what do I think of it? Well, um, I like it. Uh, I mentioned a couple of the frustrating things here on this slide, but for the most part, NextFlow has worked well for me. It's been pretty easy to use. It mostly says what it does. Occasionally, you run into weird edge cases or things that don't work uh, right away, but for the most part, they do. The documentation is pretty good. The developers are very active on GitHub. So if you're having an issue, you're likely to get feedback from the people who make NextFlow, which is nice. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed using it. It's never been so opaque and frustrating that I've sat down and said, I want to look into using something else. I've always been able to get it to work for me. So now that we're approaching the end of this talk, I have a quick uh, announcement from the Cybers team. Um, they're hard at work implementing NextFlow into Kakao, the cloud automation and continuous analysis orchestration platform uh, that Cybers gives you. It's a service for researchers and educators that eliminates the complexity of using multiple cloud systems. And with the implementation of NextFlow into Kakao, users are able to or will be able to execute uh, NextFlow workflows across different cloud computing uh, clusters of your choice, whether that's Amazon Web Services, Azure, Google Cloud, or OpenStack. Um, so just know that NextFlow is coming to Cybers if that's something that you're interested in. And with that, some quick acknowledgments. Uh, thanks, of course, to the people who fund me um, and to the uh, HPC staff at the University of Montana's Grizz Cluster and the University of Arizona's um, HPC system. Also, special thanks to Travis, my advisor, and George Lessica, a former lab member who helped me figure out how to use NextFlow myself. Also, uh, thanks to pseudomonas.com for the bacterial genomes that I use in my example code, which I'll be posting on GitHub uh, today after this video. And with that, um, are there any questions? Yes, uh, let's please type in questions for Travis or actually with a small group like this, we can uh, let people unmute if they want and ask any questions. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for doing my work. You've plugged cacao, which is something that Cybers has been working on diligently. We hope to have a, a webinar on cacao and all of its different functionalities and how it works and how to access it perhaps in May uh, this year, but we're, it's really just depends on when we can release that. So um, in the meantime, if there aren't any further questions, uh, thank you so much. That's been fabulous, really helpful information on for anybody of how to get started. And I loved your, uh, how to avoid certain pitfalls because that's often the thing that <laughs> people learn the hard way. And so you've, I'm sure saved somebody from, uh, tearing their hair out in frustration. So if there are no questions for Connor, um, oh wait, somebody's raised their hand. Yes. Uh, Matt, do you yeah, want to I'm, mute? Okay, are you able to hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I had a question about do like basic um kind of uh basic checks for things like directories existing, like you gave an example that like you in yeah. directory and you expected FNA files. If that directory does, doesn't exist or there are no files like that, is it detected automatically or do you have to um you know have that those checks um add those checks yourself? That's a great question. Um, so the path type in uh, Nextflow, uh, when you like create a path, um, like um, if I go back through my slides here, uh, oh, right here, like this from paths method, uh, it actually has an argument you can set, which will check if each thing in it exists. By default, it does not, but it does have built-in support. You have to turn it on though. Thank you. Of course. All right. I don't see any other raised hands or um, questions. Sorry, Matt. Uh, Tom. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Along those lines, Connor, um, you just showed a conditional in a workflow. Are you able to use the full power of the Groovy language, or is that constrained um, to a DSL there? Ooh. That's a really good question. I know that you can have um, inline Groovy in Nextflow, so I bet there's a way to do it. I haven't played with it too much myself, but you can definitely have more complicated conditionals than just saying, if this variable is true. Like in workflows I've written, I have conditionals that check the extension of a file and do different things depending on that file extension. So I don't know for sure, but I probably, I would be surprised if that's not the case, at least. Anyone thank else? You. Yeah, thank you, Connor. Okay, well, with that, thank you everyone for attending. Connor, thank you so much for all the time and energy you put into the, giving this presentation. We will uh, process the video and post that along with Connor's slides to our website. So see you online next time, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.